Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 23. I'm your host, Derek Moore. Today, we're going to get into a few things. One is uh, I'm going to answer some questions that I've been getting recently. And first things first, well, second we'll do is the yield curve inversion. We're hearing about the yield curve inversion. The recession is coming. The recession is coming. So let's get a little bit of historical perspective on what that is. And maybe if that's something you're worried about, you know, we can consider looking at uh, really the best way to, to hedge in, in any type of environment. But also, every once in a while, I've been getting questions. And recently, in fact, last week, I did an episode talking about how to adjust the return for inflation, so your real return. Uh, but I also get questions often of, hey, you know, I hear about simple averages but that might not be what I experienced. There's something called a compounding growth rate. Can you just help me understand why they call them all these different types of expressing returns? What's the difference? And so today I'll, I'll cover that first. Then I'll go into the, the yield curve inversion stuff, since I'm sure if you've turned on any financial news network, you're hearing a lot of things about this yield curve inversion. So we'll get to that. All right. So first things first. When we look at returns, one of the things that you look at a return, you say, okay, and let's just use this example here. Let's say the first year you've got a million dollars and you lose 50%. Ooh, that's a bad year, right? But you lose 50% of your money, so you go from a million to 500,000. And then in year two, you get a return of plus 50%. Very good. But your money doesn't go back to a million. Your money goes to 750000 Why? Because you had 500000 now. You have less money. So when that 50% return hits, you're only back to seven hundred fifty. So on a cumulative basis, point to point, you're down 25% uh, total over the two years, right? And so sometimes you'll hear simple averages. And let's look at it this way. Year one, you lose 50%. Year two, you make 50% return. Well, what happens is if you just simply sum those two together and divide by two, the number of years, your simple average is going to be 0%. You say, wait a second, I didn't experience 0%. I'm still down 25% here in this you know, hypothetical example, right? Well, remember that if you lose 50%, you need 100% to get back to break even. And it deals with how you compound the, the returns and the assets in the account, right? So what happens is if you do a simple average, your return is zero. And what, has to, what needs to happen if you want to understand more of a compounding growth rate, uh, you've got to take what's called a geometric average. And the geometric average basically takes all of the uh, the returns adds one to them and then subtracts one. So you kind of sum them up, you add one, and then at the end of it, you kind of subtract one and you get a geometric return. And so in our same example where the simple average is 0%, the geometric return is actually negative, about negative 13.5%. And so simple average zero geometric return negative 13.5% as an annualized rate of return. And think about it, that makes sense because on an annualized basis, on a compounding basis, you had a million, now you have 750,000. So your annualized rate of return on a geometric basis is more accurate to what an investor would actually experience. So that's sort of a quick explanation of those. The other thing that People had some questions about after last week's episode, and of course, link to that episode in the show notes where I talked about how the dollar's been losing purchasing power and adjusting returns for inflation. But there's something called a real return, real return, and real return means after inflation. And so let's look at an example. Let's say you had what's called a nominal return, and nominal just means without accounting for any adjustments for inflation. You were up 8%. Okay, you think 8%, thank you very much, I'll take that return. But inflation was 2.5%. And so if you adjust for inflation, because remember, as things get more expensive, the money that you have can purchase less stuff. And so your real return adjusts or accounts for any inflation jump. And you could do what's called a back of the envelope, back of the napkin calculation, where you can take the nominal return return 
minus inflation, so 8% minus 2.5%. That's going to get you about uh, you know plus 5.5%. But there's actually a formula, and the real return is equal to the return that you get minus inflation divided by 1 plus inflation. So if you want to be a little more accurate, that formula gives you a real return of plus 5.37%. So a little different from the, the other one, the back of the napkin one. So real return, though, accounts for inflation because it shows how much more purchasing power you have after inflation, after the gains, um, or if you have losses, uh, it, it does sort of the same thing, adjusted for inflation. And so to kind of wrap up, I don't want to spend too much time on this because certainly you didn't tune in to listen to me reel off number after number. But the point of doing this is just we get questions on this and simple return or a simple average just takes up all of the uh, the amounts and divides them by the number of years. So if you do you know 10 years worth of returns and you take an average, you divide uh, you know, by, by 10, that's your simple average. The geometric return is going to deal with compounding. That's going to be a little more relevant to what an investor would actually experience. And then your nominal return versus your real return. Nominal is just whatever you re- returned. Your real return is accounting for inflation. So just to kind of show you, I looked, uh, let me pull this random data here, 1962 to 2018, looking at the S&P 500, the simple average of real returns, right? So that's after inflation is plus 6.94%. So that's from this time period. And I'm, hopefully my math is correct. Uh, the geometric average is 5.6%. Uh, both of those are in real terms, so accounting for inflation. But you can see the geometric average is less, and that's typical. Normally, you'll see the geometric return be less than a simple average. Uh, but that's more of a, an accurate accounting for it, you know, dealing with compounding. And also, I've already adjusted these to be a real return after inflation. Uh, the nominal would be, would be higher, not accounting for inflation. So hopefully that, uh, that helps you out there, at least with regards to returns, because I know you listen to the, the CNBCs and the Fox business, the Bloombergs, and they throw around these terms, but they really never explain necessarily what they're, what they're actually talking about. So Okay, next thing I wanted to cover is this whole yield curve inversion. The If you listen to the financial news networks, the recession is coming, the recession is coming. Is it coming? Uh, why or why not? And is this time different? Uh, so let's take a look at what they're talking about. When you are dealing with a yield curve inversion. And by the way, I'll just pause for a second. Where I'm recording this, they're redoing the roof here. And so uh, there's nothing I can, I couldn't pick another time to record. So uh, we'll just have to deal with the the noise and hopefully it's not too loud. They weren't right above me right now, but I can still hear them. So I'm sure you can. But we, we think about the yield curve, the yield curve. And I did a whole episode of this back in August as the yield curve started to get much flatter. But it's just taking a look at all the different maturities, let's say, of U.S. Treasuries. And you can do it for different uh, governmental uh, you know, bonds. You can do it for bonds in Germany. You can do it for uh, you know, different ones in Europe. But let's say if we look at three months, six months, 12 months, two year, five year, 10 year, 30 year. And you would just put on a piece of paper and say, OK, the three month yield is 2.38%. So I'll put my little dot there and then I'll The six month is 2.42%. I'll put my little dot there. The 12 month is 2.39 and so on and so forth. Now, generally, shorter term yields are lower than longer term yields. And that's mostly due to, you know, there is a a time, let's say, premium uh, for tying up your money for longer periods of time. Uh, We could maybe do another episode on why that is. But generally, in a normal yield curve, you'd expect the front end of the curve, meaning the shorter data maturities, to be lower than the longer data maturities. But what's happened recently is that uh, a couple of days ago, three-month yields were yielding higher on a yield basis than the 10-year bond, U.S. Treasury bond. And so that sort of set off uh, a lot of stories about this. If you Google it, there's no lack of stories. 
And there's also a number of people saying why and why not it matters. So the reason why people look at this is there's been, and I think I'm looking since 1970, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. So seven recessions, including the 1970 recession. And people look at this because they say, um, or they, they've, uh, they point to before each of the last seven recessions, three-month yields have been higher than, let's say, 10-year yields. Now, I should also say that, you know, we had different parts of the curve invert in December, December of 2018. And, you know, that, that caused some uh, consternation. You'll hear people say it's twos and tens, meaning two-year yields against 10-year yields. Other people say, it's well, it's really three-month yields against 10-year yields. Uh, although I think twos and fives inverted in December, uh, twos and tens have not yet inverted. Remember, inversion happens when the front end is is longer, or I'm sorry, higher in yield than the, the far end. So just taking a look and pulling some of the data, if we look at the last seven recessions, now in 1966, uh, I believe, and the Cleveland Fed had a piece out on this, Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, uh, in 1966, there was an inversion, but there was no uh, recession. And just just because something inverts this time doesn't necessarily mean it's guaranteed to be a recession, but you're hearing a lot of talk about it. Put it in perspective, in the 2008-2009 recession, uh, August of 06 is when the three-month yield was higher than the 10-year. And that was actually 17 months prior to the recession. In 2001, it inverted in July of uh, 2000. And then by April of 01, that's where the start of the recession. And that was nine months later. So you look at this, and in 80, it was 15 months. In 2001, it was nine months. 74 was six. The average is about 12 months. Again, I'm not saying that a recession is necessarily coming. And there's going to be a lot of argument that I'll leave up to other folks about why or why not. But this is kind of what they're saying. And one of the things, too, is, you know, we've had a decade plus, uh, well, I guess about a decade, where the Federal Reserve put rates next to zero. And so one of the things to understand is that the Federal Reserve can do a couple things. They can change the Fed funds rate, the discount rate, and the interest on excess reserves. And so Fed funds rate is the rate that banks would lend to one another. So let's say one bank says, hey, we need a little bit more in reserve. We need some cash. Uh, bank A calls Bank B. It says we'd like to uh, borrow some money. And the Fed funds rate is the, the rate that the banks can borrow from one another at. The discount rate... Uh, sometimes called the discount window, is the rate at which banks can borrow from the Federal Reserve. And then interest on excess reserves, or IOER, uh, ever since 2008, so they, they never had done this before, but banks can park excess reserves at the Federal Reserve itself, and the Federal Reserve will pay interest on those reserves. Now, these three numbers, to give you an example right now, the Fed funds rate is about 2.4%. And it used to be they, they targeted an exact number. Now it's more of a, a range. Uh, but the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S., uh, they control the front end of the curve the most. They really, uh, they can't control the back end, meaning the further maturities quite as much, simply because, you know, if they're raising rates, they're raising rates um, and those are embedded in the front end of the curve. In other words, if let's say the Fed funds rate is 2.4%, you're probably going to see, you know, three month treasuries, at least that right around that. Um, the further end of the curve, though, is a little bit more about supply and demand. And, you know, one of the things you see, there's negative rate bonds in Europe, rates are really low across different uh, parts of Europe and other parts of the world. And so as people demand more treasury bills, let's say fives or tens or thirties, um, you know, more buyers, uh, they push yields down because as demand goes up for bonds, bonds go up 
price goes uh, uh, price goes down, or yields go down, right? So you've got this this demand for for treasury. So whether or not this this time is different, I think it will be you know it remains to be seen. But I will link to some of the historical data. Um, one of the interesting things too, and I and I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't remember this, uh, but in two thousand eight two thousand nine. They've got another thing where it says not only the the inversion to recession start, which back then was 17 months, but you've also got the disinversion uh, to recession end. In other words, so yields are inverted, front ends are larger than back ends. How long before recession ends when the curve actually normalized? And in 2008, 2009 recession, it's actually 24 months. And that was interesting because, you know, the Federal Reserve dropped rates down, oh, I don't know, you know, really quickly. And rates were about, you know, 0.25%. So the front end of the curve, even though the 10-year at one point got, you know, down into the 100 basis points and change, the front end was so low that you had this disinversion uh, that the Federal Reserve by bringing rates down. Because the long end never got to 0.25, 30 years never went to 0.25, 10 years never went to 0.25. So I thought that was interesting that it was actually tw- uh, 24 months or a full two years after the rate uh, changed. We didn't see, that was probably the longest one that we've seen. The average is about 10 months after the rate. And by the way, the average amount of time that something inverts is 12 months as well. So as far as when, you know, look, I mean, things could invert, they could go back and forth. Uh, we saw the parts of the curve invert in December, and then they readjusted. In fact, as I'm doing this podcast and recording it, we actually can see that the three-month yield is 2.38%, and the 10-year is 2.41%. So does that get credit for going back under, and uh, how long does it actually have to stay is another story. So, uh, But yield curve inversion, you're going to hear a lot about this. One of the reasons or the uh, the talking points around why yield curve inverting is is not great, well, it's really two reasons. Number one is banks tend to pay on the short end, so they might pay for deposits, and they take that money and they lend it out on the long end, like in mortgages or other types of things. And so if theoretically they're paying more uh, on the money than they can get lending it out, it hurts their net interest margins. The other thing that people argue is that if rates are really low, um, I'm sorry, if rates are higher in the short run and they are the long run, one of the arguments is that people perceive that the economy is going to be weaker and therefore rate, you know, the front end is is bigger than the the back end. And some people look at that as weakening the economy or an indication. So you're going to see a lot of stuff on this and we'll have more on this uh, next week. I may have a, a, a guest on. And maybe we'll get into this a little bit more, but yield curve inversion, that's what's going on there. Uh, All right, folks, uh, in the essence of, I'm not sure how much of the the roof action here you're picking up, uh, but I I wanted to do a quick one today and check in because you're hearing all the stuff about the yield curve. And I've been getting questions on all these different ways that we calculate returns. I'd encourage you to listen also to the previous weeks where I discussed dollar purchasing power and how inflation erodes the purchasing power over the years and how you can inflation adjust something. And I'll also link to the initial ex- explanation of what a yield curve inversion is. I uh, did that back, in, I think it was August of last year, or it was towards the end of last year. We started to see the yield curve flattening. Just some discussion about what it is and, and whatnot. So I'd also remind you or ask uh, want to ask of you, you know, everyone says rate and review the podcast. Uh, if you want to do that, you can do that. But honestly, just share the podcast. If you think what we're doing here is valuable and somebody else that you know might be interested, whether it's this episode or other episodes, go ahead and share it to them. You know, a lot of people don't realize they can listen to podcasts and there's tons of them out there now. Uh, but all I'd ask is please share it if you're finding value in it. And also, if you go to RazorWealth.com, if you have an idea for a future podcast, something you think I'd like you'd like me to cover, uh, I'd love to hear from you and get any feedback that you have. It's always good to hear from people, and some of the ideas for these podcasts come out of questions that I get, uh, both in the general course of interaction and 
uh, people reaching out to me on the podcast. All right, folks, we'll be back next week with a longer episode. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about options and volatility and maybe more about the shield curve. Talk to you then. Bye.